Welcome to Media Coffee, a podcast series hosted by Cision, where we delve into media and communications. We are excited to have a special guest in this episode, Melissa Ambers, founder of Savvy Media Group Incorporated. Along with Savvy Media Group, she also owns one of the first minority women-owned full-service marketing firms globally. She will give us insights on how PR and comms professionals can effectively pitch their stories, the importance of press releases in a company or brand's marketing strategy, and the opportunity to share her upcoming book with us. As a global provider of earned media software and services, Cision aims to equip PR agencies and communications professionals with the necessary tools and knowledge to succeed. We believe that understanding the media industry and building strong relationships with journalists is crucial for effective communication strategies. If you're curious to learn more about Cision and how we can assist you in enhancing your PR efforts, please visit our website, email us, or follow us on your social media accounts for the latest news and updates. Well, Melissa, I want to thank you for being a guest on today's episode. And before we get started with the questions, let's begin by informing the listeners a little bit about yourself, how you got into marketing, and what led you to create Savvy Media Group. Wow. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, Savvy Media Group was born in 2019, right before the world just went crazy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, of course, not knowing what was going to happen, um, I created Savvy Media Group um, in, because I kind of just fell into branding and marketing. And I say I kind of okay. fell into it because... Um, it's really, it's not the direction that I was going, you know, I'm really strong, you know, strategic processes, uh, SOPs, things like that. But everybody will come and say, hey, Melissa, how do you do this? Or why would you do this? And I'm helping them. I'm talking them through it. And the conversation just kept going. Mm-hmm. And um, talking to someone, they just start calling me a publicist. I'm like, I'm not a publicist. You know, and it's like, well, yes, you are. Because you do this, you do this. I'm like, yeah okay, I guess I got to take that, you know? So yeah, um, it's, it's one of the things that just kind of happened. Um, and I know, you know, there's a lot of people that go to school for the things like that, but in life's journey, you know, sometimes things happen and, you know, we have skills that we just really don't realize we have. And that's kind of what happened. And Savvy Media Group was born because um, of that's one of the reasons, but I want to also create like an umbrella for the uh, digital magazine and the podcast that I have uh, for that. So uh, as I was building all these things and talking to people, I was like, okay, how can I help people with, you know, within my area and, you know, without it being thousands and thousands of dollars. So just thinking through that and trying to really build that brand, um, I stuck with Savvy Media Group and because of COVID and, you know, everybody was selective on where they were going, I decided to get just a small space. And I said, this way it's private. It's more of like an intimate setting, small office where people can come meet, sit down, feel comfortable Mm -hmm. talking about their business and know that it's confidential and things like that. So that's where the marketing studio came from. Yes. I know I'm throwing out a lot of brands here, but <laughs> no, it's that's fine. how it's the fine. marketing yeah. studio was uh, born. Mm-hmm. And with that, you know, as I start researching and figuring out the name, everybody that had that name was more so, you know, websites, logo, graphic design, you know, all those different things. And that's not where I was going, but I wanted that small space. I was like, well, hold up. Let me just go ahead and do this. The marketing studio branded, uh, copyright everything. And then that's how I figured out globally, there's nowhere, uh, with, no one with that name, the marketing studio that yes. focuses on business development and branding. So I immediately copyrighted. Yeah. <laughs> so I could lock that in. Of course. And that's how the global, you know, thing was born and, from that, just, you know, doing the magazine and the uh, podcast, it just sits under that umbrella of marketing. So all of my clients that I work with, once we go through, you know, so many phases, um, I automatically, you know, give them their first opportunity of being in media to say, hey, here's a platform. Let's go ahead and do you a one or two page, you know, ad, depending on what they're doing. Let's get you on the podcast. So it gives them that first 
interaction into yeah. media, you know, pushing your business. Yes. And not only that, um, it's practice too. Because as we're going through it and if they mess up or, you know, kind of up too much or not prepared, yeah. Yeah. I can easily pause and say, you know what, let's come back to this later. And I kind of give them some pointers. So it gives them the open door to start doing, you know, some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Of course, of course, yes. Well, thank you for sharing that story with the listeners. Um, well, um, we can get started with the questions. Um, okay. We use, so a common question that we start out with on the podcast is asking our guests how our clients can make their pitches stand out to journalists and media outlets, as this is a common struggle for most of our listeners. In your opinion, what are some of the best practices for pitching to journalists and media outlets? The first thing would be is to do your research. And I mean, okay. a deeper, a little bit deeper besides just going to you know, a, a, a station and say, okay, I want to be on this platform and you find the journalist's name, go a little deeper. Is this the right journalist for you? For whatever your business or industry is, you want to make sure this is their topic. Uh, what they talk about, are they morning, midday, evening? You know, when, when are they on? What are some of the things that they do? So you want to go a little deeper to see if this is the right journalist or the right platform for you. Yes. And once you, you know, do that, make your list and figure out those points, then you want to, you know, okay, how can I approach them? What are you approaching them with? It can't just be, hey, I have a business. I do X, Y, Z, and I would like to be on your show. It has to make sense for that journalist. You always have to remember that they have, I don't know how many emails yeah. and, you know, text, phone calls yes. that they get saying, hey, you know, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, that thing at the car dealership that, that floats in. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, everybody's out there. Hey, what am I yeah. doing? Hey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so yeah. um, it's like, that's kind of what you look like to journalists in a way. Um, because there's so many people that's approaching them and yes. within the time frame that they have, they can't read every single thing that comes. So mm -hmm. how are you going to stand out? What is your headline? Um, what is your first paragraph, your first two, three sentences? What is it saying? So you want to make sure that you really focus on that because that's how they're going to skim. They're going to look at your headline and if that's a, a complete X is okay, next. But if you could get past the headline, then what are the first two or three sentences going to say that's going to say, you know, let's read a little bit more. Then you may have an opportunity to be on, you know, one of those platforms. Yeah, of course. I definitely agree with that. Uh, to follow up with that, um, how soon should uh, you follow up with journalists and also how often should you follow up with them? Should you do it once or... Uh, should you do it a few times? And what about the frequency? Right. The common rule is seven touches, right? So um, with that, you want to, you know, create your schedule. Um, everybody, you know, have different levels. So if you want to create a spreadsheet, if you have a project management tool, you use Google, whatever your thing is, yes. create you a schedule. And if you know that you reached out to them on this day, you know, give them like seven days later. And then after that first, your second one, you know, make it like maybe five or six days. And after that, I will hit every like three days uh, if they don't respond. But you also really need to pay attention to if they are not responding, uh, maybe don't just keep going in. Hey, did you see my email? Hey, did you see my email? Go in with something different where, you know, yes. hey, I'm sure you're busy, but, you know, I just want to see if you were interested in the story on X, Y, Z because of, you know, X, Y, Z. Why is it, you know, why should they care? You know, that's yes. the reality of this. Why should they care? You know, so what you have a business, so what you, you know, doing whatever in the community, mm -hmm. why should they care? So that's why you really want to make sure that you're standing out in that way and give them something that they, that, that will, that attract them and bring them into your story. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Uh, to follow up with that, what about using methods such as a phone call or a LinkedIn message to mm -hmm. follow up with journalists that you're pitching to? Would you uh, think that's a mm -hmm. viable strategy for following up? That's part of your touches. So oh. the touches is not just email. Okay. So your touches can be, you know, uh, your email uh, on social media, 
Um, if they so every so often you will find a journalist that'll have a number say, hey, you could text this, text, you know, whatever those means are. So whatever, however you're reaching out, that's considered a touch. Okay, got it. And uh, the last question that I have for uh, this topic, uh, what are some of the best ways to build and maintain relationships with journalists and media outlets? And if you would like, could you also share some successful connections that you facilitated uh, with them, if you'd like? Um, it's just simply staying in touch. And staying in touch is not always in the uh, in the sale mode or me, me, me mode. You know, uh, follow them on social media, engage with their posts. If you're out somewhere, you see them, don't become, you know, that fan. You know, just simply walk up. Hey, how you doing? I'm such and such. You know, I did send you an email about, you know, X, Y, Z. And if they be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They may jump in and have a conversation right then. But if they don't remember, don't force the issue for them yeah. to remember. Um, so it's just really building those relationships. And we tend to forget that sometimes because we're just so busy in selling mode and me, me, yeah. me, I need to be on this platform. And I get it. You know, we, we have to have that exposure. But um, when, when you are following up and you're building those relationships, I'm not saying you have to reach out every week or every day. You may not follow up with them to maybe three or four weeks later. But even they're going to get used to seeing your name. They're going to get used to seeing you. And eventually, you know, you never know what, you know, may happen with that. Um, you know, with me, um, I've been in events and you have to listen. It's that, that active ear that you have yeah. to have on when people are talking and, you know, not so much listening to, again, self, 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 but listen to naturally have that conversation of something that they were talking about or had an yes. issue with. And then you never know where that conversation may go. Um, I've met people in public, you know, out in networking events and, you know, other people have introduced me to other people. Um, and then your uh, social media presence. We can't, you know, in business, we can't say, oh, I got a personal page and it's my business page. Mm -hmm. Even though that's your personal page, it's online and people are going to look for that. Yes. Even though your business may be XYZ Incorporated, they know your name. Yes, I'm going to look at XYZ Incorporated, but I'm going to also go over here and I'm going to listen and look and see what she's doing over here on this side. Yes. So that can also impact uh, the way a person may you know, interact with you. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that I, I also have is my uh, media kit. I actually use my media kit a lot more than my website. I know some people may cringe on that, but <laughs> I, I do. And it's, it's I, I have everything in there. Yes. And I know it's a lot, but I also use it as a resource. If I have to go yeah. back, I'm like, wait, when did I do such and such? And as humans, we're naturally nosy. So yes. we're going to want to look and see different things. So on that media kit, even though I have everything in there on my my personal one and I also have you know buttons and links to go off if they want to go to the magazine or podcast or whatever yeah. but that's those are the branches that you want to put out if they choose to do that if they don't want to they'll stay right where they are but because you know scrolling through my media kit because you know instead of just sending that one sheet that was requested yeah. I sent that but in addition the link to that again we're naturally nosy and when we start looking at those things yes. Oh, I didn't know you did such and such. Oh, I didn't know you was here. By the way, such and such, you know, ask me about this. Maybe let me introduce you to them and maybe, you know, you could connect with them to do, yeah. you know, whatever. So you have to look at that. And I don't want people to take being nosy in a negative sense. I know it kind of seems negative, but we have to be nosy to really see what a person is doing. Yeah, That's of part of your research. Yeah. That's really, you know, part of your research of whether it's a media kit, whether you are on Google, social media, whatever it is. Yes. That's part of our research. Yeah. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, to move along, I want to ask you about the importance of press releases, especially uh, regarding uh, to a company's uh, brand or mm -hmm. a marketing strategy. How important are press releases today? And are they still viewed as a vital tool to a company's marketing strategy? Yes, they're definitely uh, considered a vital tool. Um, a lot is going over to social media, but 
I still say press releases or viable because when you go to um, the various sites to drop your press press release, yes. prime example, this one right here, yes. <laughs> to drop your press release, um, it's so many you know, media uh, journalists that's going to these specific sites and, okay, let's see who's on here, right? But be careful with your press release. Don't just do a press release just because. You know, I've heard some people say, every single thing you do, do a press release. You're going to get watered down because yeah. now when people see your name, they don't get used to seeing your name. But now when they see your name, it's going to be like, I don't know what she's doing. Let me just keep going. And that's the time that you really want them to look the time that they decide to go past you because you've gotten watered down because every little thing you did, you did a press release. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, you know, as far as my opinion, press releases should be that big thing that you really want to put out there and let people see hey, this is happening. Those are the things where you want to get the attention. And the reality is you want to get the attention for that big thing that you're doing. Prime example, the release of my book is a press release. Yeah. So, you know, it's things like yeah. that that you want to um, you want to do. So be careful with your press releases and don't do one for every single thing. I know there's a lot of people that that's a rule for them and things to do. But my opinion, I would not do that because you don't want to get watered down. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. And to follow up with that, how do you use press releases in your day-to-day -day work with clients or just uh, how you use it uh, for yourself in your business? It would, what I just said, you know, oh. on the big things, yeah. you know, so it would be the big things that's happening. Um you know, every it, like for instance, on my podcast, I don't do a press release every time I have a guest. There are some people that do that. Hey, such and such is going to be yeah. a guest on the show, unless it's like a huge, huge name or something. I don't do that. So it's those big things. So now, even though my book is not going to officially uh, be released until the 27th of October, yes. um, I'm already out there where I have the post and I'm putting things out there on social media. So that's kind of like your ramp up as well, because when that press release come out, guess what? They're going to go to your social media, yeah. <laughs> right? That's yeah. just the nature of the beast right now. So I've already been putting out there about the book, you know, uh, talking about it. You know, there are some other things that I have not released yet. But um, behind the scenes, working on putting together some of those things. So it's just really using those those big opportunities to say, you know, this is what's happening. Now, if you have, say you're coming out with um, a podcast, a magazine, or if you have an apparel brand, you're launching a new uh, collection or something. Absolutely. Do a press release on those. But within that collection or every guest or issue that you have out, it's not necessary to do a press release. Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you for uh, sharing your insights on that. Absolutely. Next, I would like to ask you some questions, questions that could help aspiring marketing and communications professionals. So as a marketing professional as yourself, how do you establish and maintain your brand within the industry? And how has that helped you in your career? So far, um, it has helped me because I'm authentic. Um, I don't try to put on a mask to make me seem a lot larger than what I really am. Yeah. I stay within my area. Um, and when I say stay within my area, I'm not saying um, to downgrade yourself or don't continue to climb. Yeah. But if you know you're not as big as a Fortune 100 company, don't put yourself out there as a Fortune 100 yeah, company. Of course. Yeah. If you're just getting started or you're building, that's kind of where, where you know you need to stay. And that's, that's what I do. I practice that. Um, that's what I share with my clients is, you know, yes, we all want that you know, that big, that really, really large payday. Yeah. <laughs> but at yeah. the same time, don't put yourself out there because you set yourself up a failure. So it's all about, you know, for me, being authentic, knowing the space that I'm in, continuously networking, um, you know, trying to show up in those right places, the right rooms, talking to people. Don't be shy about your brand, regardless of what it is. Yeah. Um, and don't get discouraged if you are in a place and someone may not think that you are as big as, you know, they are and you kind of get, sh you know, shoot away a little bit. That's going to happen, unfortunately. Yeah. 
but don't get discouraged with that. You know, continue to stay where you are and just keep pushing. You'll eventually get there and just keep, you know, doing what you're doing, educating yourself, learning, never stop learning. I want to say that never stop learning. There's always something new going on and especially at the rapid pace of technology right now. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, discuss your upcoming book. Melissa, I'm honored to have the opportunity to read a quick excerpt from your <laughs> forthcoming book, Beyond Business as Usual, Leading in the Digital Area. I think personally it would be a fantastic read based on the portion that I read, but I wanted to take some time out uh, for you to tell the listeners more about your book and to ask you a few questions related to some of the things you talked about in the portion that I read. So I'll let okay. you go ahead and take it. Okay, well, Beyond Business as Usual came about, um, not only are we in this digital era where things are like just rapidly moving, uh, AI, the way we're working, streamlining, automation, all these different things um, that are being utilized in the workplace, but there are still, you know, that group of people that's still doing business as usual. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, it always works. Why should we change? Or they don't want to make the investment or if they make a small investment thinking, okay, well, we change this piece. You changed it, but you didn't train nobody. You didn't, you know, you didn't focus on the group. It's like you didn't do anything. It's like you just put a Band-Aid on. And, you know, one of the quotes that I say is that, you know, that Band-Aid only lasts so long before you need another one. Yes. So, you know, with that, it's like you have to go in deep and fully, you know, look at some of those things that need to be done. And um, I didn't want to, you know, doing business as usual or status quo or anything like that. I was like, let's go beyond business as yes. usual and, you know, be a leader in that digital era, because that is the reality of the world that we're in, whether we want to accept it or not. That's just the reality because the world is going to continue to move whether you do or no. So, you know, creating this book, it was, you know, giving you those tools and, you know, pieces of information of how to go in deep, how you should work with your leaders. Um, when you're doing training, it's more than just a checkbox. You really have to unlearn and relearn the things that are happening. So it's talking about a lot of those things, um, you know, doing those deep, deep dives, assessing, your entire organization, not just the higher level, is pretty much going down on, on the sea floor and looking at what's happened down at the bottom of the ocean and, you know, working your way up. Yes. Because a lot of times, you know, you looking up here thinking, okay, well, if it's good here, everything else is good down here and it's not. Yes. And a lot of times is you have that rotating door of employees coming in and out because, they're not happy because we're working extra hard unnecessarily. Uh, we've complained multiple times about systems not working or it's taking too much time to do, you know, whatever it is on the system. But you have somebody else in another department over kind of overlaying some of the things that this person is doing. So you're doing double dipping, paying two employees to do almost the exact same thing when everything could be done in this one, you know, system. So it's really looking at that, rewriting your SOPs, revamping everything, taking your leaders to a training that they need, not just grouping them all in one room. Yeah. So in this book is, you know, really talking about, you know, that and separating your leaders, understanding what your leaders need and breaking them into groups and giving them what they need and not just here's a general training list, check the box, you went to the training or, you know, your staff. So it's showing you yes. some of them things. Um, I wanted to make it a really simple read, uh, no fluff, not a whole bunch of unnecessary stories and things like that. But, you know, even throughout the book, you know, I bold some statements in there. I kind of like to highlight some things to, um, you know, bring your, uh, bring to your awareness, like, you know, if it's risk, uh, engaging with your employees. Um, one thing is like a uh, negative impact on their work. You know, that's one thing that's highlighted. Uh, increased workload. So it's highlighting those, you know, uh, touch points for you to really take aim at, oh, wait, let me look at this. Yeah, let me, you know, see about, you know, the, the workload. 
um, the reduced job satisfaction. How can I fix this? Yes. So that way we can stop with the rotating door. And when we're attracting the right employees and training our current yes. employees, we can, you know, see the difference. So investing now is the best thing to do if you have not done so already. So once you make that investment, um, you will start to see that return because now your customers are getting the experience that they are expecting. They don't want the same old, same old. They're going to go over to, you know, the competition. So customers are looking for something different. So if your customers want something different, you have to change internally yes. and let people uh, do things differently. And this goes not only from employees, systems, processes, uh, communication, really having a true open door policy and not just saying it's open door. Yes. So it's it's just changing all of these different things that's in organizations that so many are just not, you know, doing or they're putting a Band-Aid on it for now. Yes. Um, I have some questions for you. Uh, the questions are related to, like I said before, they're a part of the Ed script of the book that I read. Um, and they're pretty much tailored to, you know, our, our listeners who are, you know, mm -hmm. in the comms and uh, PR, you know, profession. Uh, okay. In your book, you highlighted uh, the case of Blockbuster, as everybody inf infamously knows. Mm -hmm. um, it serves as a cautionary tale about the consequences of not adapting to technological disruption. How mm -hmm. can communications professionals or marketing professionals stay ahead of industry trends and help their organizations avoid becoming the next blockbuster? One huge thing right now, and so many people are afraid of it, is chat GPT. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It is, yeah. it, it, it's, it's your friend, it's yeah. an assistant. So I don't know if I want to say similar to that situation, but kind of mm -hmm. sort of, because it's here, it's not going anywhere. It's not. Yes. And the reason that, you know, it is here, Google is having a, uh, you know, doing their version of it and it's going to keep going. Everybody's going to have their version of yeah. chat GPT and it's okay. Now, which one is the best to use? Um, yes, it writes for you. You put in your prompts. It does all these different things. But when you use uh, when you use something like you know, regardless of what which whichever one you're using, we'll just say AI. When you're using these tools, this is considered as if you hired an assistant. Look at it as if if you hired an assistant to sit at a desk and you're saying, okay, I need you to do research to do X, Y, Z, or I need to, you know, get this graphic designer to do X, Y, Z. It's no different than that. The only difference is that it's happening a lot quicker. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It's saving you a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, you know, those type of things, you know, so when you put your prompts in and it write out whatever, you know, you ask it to write, you have still have to read it. You yeah, have to go course. back and yeah. check it and make sure that it's your voice. Um, yes. and that what is being said is factual. Um, so it's just a way to help you to save time. And that's because if you think about it, we're in a world of, I want it now, I want it now, I want it now. Yes. And, um, the ion here in Houston, I was doing some accelerators there and one was on digital media kits. Huh. And the question was, why are you using that instead of just building your website? You could do either or. But the reason I, you know, I, I'm really honing on in on the digital media kit is that it's a one page that you could just scroll and have all your information. And like I said earlier, you have your branches. So if I you want to know something about the magazine, you could press this button. It'll take you over here or the uh, podcast. It'll take you here. Or if it's services, it'll take you here if they choose to. But it has everything that they need to know. All they got to do is scroll. But on the website, you have to keep drilling through. Okay, is it on this page? Okay, you click this. Now I got a drop down. Where do I select in this drop down? You got to keep drilling through it. And that is what is um, turning people away because we want it now. I need the answer now. Yes. I don't have to spend 20 minutes trying to figure out where the answer is. And then once I find it's on this page, now let me scroll through and find the answer. So, yeah. you know, that's spending, you know, 30, 40 minutes 
trying to figure out and they don't want to sit on no website to try to figure out certain things like that. So yes. it's we in the world of I want it now, I want it now. And that's why you should really befriend AI yeah. and not be afraid of it. Can you discuss how communications professionals can leverage partnerships with media outlets and influencers to enhance their PR strategy and brand visibility? Right. I think that um, the thing that's in so many uh, minds of PR marketing professionals is competition. You're going to steal my client or you're going to take my idea or, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, first, if you have a conversation with somebody and that is immediate to you, then that's somebody you really shouldn't work with anyway. But we have to get out of that mindset because if you're constantly thinking of, oh, well, you're going to steal this from me or you're going to try to do this or, you know, whatever it is, you're never going to be able to move forward. So finding that right person to partner with, collaborate with, and this comes from, again, building those relationships. So having those actual conversations, you know, go have coffee and lunch. If you're not in the same uh, state or country, you know, jump on Zoom or Google Meet and have those face-to-face -face conversations and, you know, actually talk. I'm not saying, you know, reveal everything, but, you know, have conversations to where, you know, you're having, you know, you're talking and what do you do? Okay, this is what I do. We kind of cross a little bit, but, you know, you may do this and I don't and vice versa, but this is how we can help each other. We come together, we can do blah, blah, blah. And while we do cross and we're doing the same thing, when I get overwhelmed or you get overwhelmed, we can help each other. And then guess what? That's going to bring in more money. So now you're splitting it. Because if you were by yourself, you probably would have turned down that job or either lost out on some other opportunities because you couldn't handle all of that. But now you have somebody that do the exact same thing that you do, even though y'all may do it a little differently. Now you didn't have to turn that opportunity down. So I think just really having those conversations uh, and listening and get out of that mindset of that strong competition, you know, of each other. Um, and anybody that's in that, I always refer them to um, uh, the Blue Ocean Strategy. You know, read that book because it talks about, you know, competition and all of that, not really worrying about competition. Yeah. And that can help you through that as well. Okay. Okay. And lastly, um, uh, another point I want to bring up in your book, you talked about emotional intelligence. Uh, in the context of emotional intelligence, could you provide some advice on how communications professionals can build and maintain uh, strong relationships with the media, ultimately leading to more successful, you know, press release pitches, you could say? Um, I or just think... partnerships in general, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Yeah. I think it goes back to, you know, the listening ear you know, actively listening yes. and being um, courteous of someone else's feelings. Whether you agree or don't agree is, you know, listen to what they have to say. And even if it's something you strongly disagree with, you don't have to go in with the whole, you know, disagreement. I don't think that's right. Listen to what they're saying. If it's something that they're truly passionate about, just okay, you know what, I get it, you know, that's kind of not, you know, the area where I'm in, or I may not agree with some of those things, but I completely understand where you are, you know, and just have that conversation. Uh, well, Melissa, those are all my questions for you today. Thank you for joining me and providing your insights to our listeners. And to all our listeners, if you enjoyed the episode, please share it with your friends, colleagues, and comment on your thoughts on the best practices for uh, connecting to media outlets or pitching your releases. Take care, everyone.